Hello everyone, it is two o'clock so I am going to make a start, don't want to keep you all waiting, um, but hello and welcome to our final event of the year. I actually cannot believe that we are now approaching December and super fast and well what a year we have had um, and that is exactly why we are hosting this event to look back and hopefully optimistically look forward um, at the new year to come. Um, we have had our last issue of the year which is due out tomorrow and if I do say so myself it is a good one. Um, we've looked back at our previous issues and the topics that we've covered and how they've been affected by this year, Covid and the national lockdown. So it's a really interesting issue and some really great features in there. Today's event I'm super excited for as we have a great lineup with uh, Jazz Broughton as our first as our keynote on first, um, which she's going to be talking all about how you run a business during a pandemic, very timely. Um, and then we have our two wonderful AI based startup founders, Dr. Alex Young of Verti and Chris Knight of CXK, sorry, C CKX, um, who I will be quizzing on 2020, the lockdown and what that has meant kind of for AI. Um, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. If you've got questions, I'm sure you've all been here before, but there's a Q&A box at the bottom. So just pop anything in there and we will get them asked. Um, I also want to, of course, say a huge thank you to our sponsor, Mauser Electronics, a worldwide leading authorised distributor of semiconductors and electronic components for over 800 industry leading manufacturers. Uh, Mauser specialises in the rapid introduction of new products and technologies for design engineers and buyers, and their extensive product offering includes semiconductors, interconnects, passives, electromechanical components, and more info can be found on them on our post event mailer. Um, or online if we see you just go to mauser.com and finally all our profits from today are going to the amazing like like-minded females lmf and the incredible work they do as a social enterprise taking inclusion to action so thank you all for supporting that great cause okay i will stop babbling on now and i will pass you over to the lovely jazz who will be leading our keynote enjoy everyone i am hoping to jump on screen uh there we go i had hidden myself and um, that's always a fun thing to do when you are talking thank you so much for joining us today um i'm going to be giving a talk all about running a business in a pandemic uh if you hadn't already seen from the event uh, Eventbrite page, I'm a coach, so beware, you may need to grab your pen and paper or the digital version of that to take some notes because I want to ask some questions. We're at a very, very, very interesting time of the year where we often take stock on everything and I want this to be no different as we look ahead to 2021 and what it really has meant and does mean to run a business during a pandemic. I remember being in the final year of secondary school in the classroom, exasperated as we all sat in silence revising for the GCSEs that we believed would actually define us. The all important tests that would open up our lives or they would limit us. The chances for us to break stereotypes and do the unusual things. You could practically feel the tension in the air, the stress and the weight of expectation then all of a sudden, my friend stood up and said, I swear, if I get a question I can't answer, I'm just going to write only God knows, because that's true. The room exploded with laughter. As we clutched our bellies in fits and we wiped the tears of joy from our eyes, we each realised that sometimes that's actually the truth and that's okay. That's the kind of year that 2020 has been for business owners. It doesn't mean we stopped studying. It just meant that every time we wished for more control and certainty, we just got more of the opposite. This year, we saw risk. We saw negative bank balances. We saw redundancies. And we saw vulnerability like never before, not just from individuals, but from companies, organizations that we felt were untouchable. 
the organizations that we lead or were huge parts of that we thought were unpenetrable fortresses of branding and being on message and for many we we even saw the problems that our solutions solve ever more acutely as both a career success coach and as a customer success manager for a product analytics tool the goals for my work are quite literally the client's goals this year those goals were to retain they were to resist burnout and fatigue and to grow a resilience never seen before. Running a business in a pandemic means resilience. It should literally be next to it in the dictionary or any other document. Resilience is actually described as the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape. Elasticity. Now, for those of you whose minds are going to economics, that's not what we're talking about. I don't want you to imagine a spreadsheet when you think of elasticity. I want you to imagine Play-Doh. Play-Doh has the ability to spring back into place. And resilience is an ability, not an instance. You see, you don't get away with being resilient only when you're trying to collect 200 pounds and pass go. True resilience is a practice. It's almost an organizational mindset, ever believing that effort will lead to results. Ever believing that the problem your solution solves is constant. And ever believing that the outcome is an opportunity. It's focused on the discipline that builds that ability and infusing it in every process, product and person. You have the ability of resilience. Yes, you. You have the hashtag resilience ability. However you want to put it, you have the discipline. And it won't be hard to find if only you look. There are some questions that you can ask yourself as you reflect back on what it has meant for you to run a business during a pandemic. How did your loyal customers stay so? What did they say? How did they respond? How long have they stayed with you? What were the conversations? How did your team prove further value? And this is in the context where we know that redundancy impacts everyone, even those who are quote unquote left behind. Furlough impacts everyone, even those who were quote unquote chosen not to get furlough. How did the team show up and how did you show up for your team? Where was the empathy? And which part of that still remains? How did you maintain well being? How did you continue to move forward with aggressive ambition, but with consideration and compassion? How did you innovate outside of the quarterly calendar? We all have the plans. We say Q1 is this, Q2 is this, Q3, Q4. And then by the end of the year, we would have taken over. Then a pandemic hits and you realize that your timelines, oh, less lines, more squiggles. How did you respond to that? Did you respond? 
how quickly or how considered did that take place? And I want you to continue with me here. What was destroyed? We can often talk about the whole idea of uh, deprecating features and uh, closing down product lines, phasing out services, but, but, but that's, that's too graceful. That is not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about the grenades. I'm talking about the grenades that got led off by our economic circumstance. I'm talking about the grenades that you had to set off within your own business, your own departments, your own strategies. What was destroyed? And what was destroyed for the better? The better. It sounds like an oxymoron, but it's a genuine question. What element of destruction has led to a path for renewal? Something new. Something otherwise undiscovered and un, untapped. We like to talk about tap, right? We, we tap into new markets and new segments, new verticals. But really, which part of our whole organ organization was, was, was destroyed and in hindsight for the better? What was accelerated? What was accelerated because of the need? What were the things that you would have liked to do a slow and steady rollout? Focus groups, research, reports, consultancy. You would have dotted every I and crossed every T. But what was accelerated because of the sheer need to. How fast did that happen? As we're going through these questions, I want you to think not only about what happened in the instance, I want you to think about the ability, the capability. Where did you see opportunities that you previously hadn't? They weren't there before. They weren't there before. They just, they just weren't. And I want you to celebrate this ability. If you've written notes, if you have taken a, 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 a note anywhere, when you look at that, I want you to celebrate this ability as a secret weapon for whatever 2021 brings. And there's three ways that you can do this. Three specific ways. And I'll give you a clue, they're going to come with some questions. The three things that you can do to use this resilience ability as your secret weapon is by looking for it. Looking at all the things that were planned against those that came to be. Open that file from 2019. Open the board deck, the pitch deck, open it. And look at those things. And then look at what you have now. Look at all the things, the lessons, the moments, the tears, the laughter, the deep breaths and emotions. And some are anticipated because nobody told us that entrepreneurship, innovation, or even just working for a startup would be easy. Nobody told us that. But I want you to think of those moments and ask yourself, what did you learn? And not only what did you learn, because it's easy, right? Some of you are answering these questions as though I'm a teacher and this is a quiz and I don't want you to do that. What did you learn about you and others? Who showed up? 
who needed support? When did you need support? What were your non-negotiables? How far were you willing to adapt and stretch? We all like to say we're flexible and adaptable, right? But are you play doh And then the last thing, look at all the things ahead for 2021. The plans, the customers, the partnerships, the revenue, the side hustle paying the bills for a bit, the dreams rolled over, the new team, the new processes, and the new normal. What does that look like? What do you want? What have you planned? And what's the first move there? What do you know to be true? Because for everything else, it's okay to say, only God knows. Thank you. Thank you, Jazz. Thank you. Um, I don't think we've necessarily got any questions that have come through yet. Um, but I wanted to ask, have you, um, have you personally started planning? And how important is planning, even though when the future is so unknown? I have definitely personally started planning uh, because I think it's important. Um, and, and, and that's something that I really touched on in the talk about having your intentions, regardless of what happens around you. Just because there's so much we can't control, it doesn't mean that we dismiss what we don't, what we can. And that can be often a sense of solace, a sense of certainty, a sense of power, because if we let go of that, we start to lose confidence in what we're doing. We start to think, what's the point in all of it? And the reality is, if you're sitting here today and you're on this call, your business is required. The levels of requirement is different. Mm. But and 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 what the problem that you solve looks like might be slightly different. Therefore, your solution might have changed, but it's still valid. What you do is still valid. So in that thread, it's important to plan, but take stock of the different ways that you can essentially bend and sort of move to what then comes up. I loved um, I loved your Play-Doh reference. <laughs> um, resilient has definitely been a word that obviously has been used quite a lot this year and, and I couldn't agree more with what you were saying. You also come across quite an optimistic person. Would you say that you, you know, you always kind of look on the positive side of things and you like to remain quite, you know, positive and upbeat? Yeah, I, I like to say I definitely like to remain on the more positive side. I think it's built in me as a coach. We're always forward looking, looking for solutions everywhere. Um, but I also say that as somebody who um, I work full time, I know I'm privileged in that. Uh, I wasn't made redundant. I have my business outside of this, but I have had a time where I was freelance and I went through depression and I don't even need to tell people on here. If you can't get up and out of bed, not only does that mean that, okay, there's something you need to look into in terms of your mental health and get the support that you deserve and need, but the reality of life as an entrepreneur and as a freelancer is if you don't work, you don't get paid. Yeah. So as much as I like to look on the bright side, it's been a mindset that I've had to cultivate and those dark places and those, those, um, thoughts do occur what I've learned over time is to let them happen and almost set a limit on them and always there are so many tools where you can go back to what can I control so I can't get up and uh, write the blog post do the analytic strategy but what can I do I can phone I can phone someone in my network I can see if there's a partnership I haven't explored. There's, there's things that you can do in small incre incremental steps, maintaining your humanhood. Entrepreneurs aren't machines. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we all go through the journey.
definitely definitely and and i've been to a couple of your workshops yourself um they are just as kind of inspiring as you have been today so thank you um we have got a couple of questions um that have come through um someone said this has stirred a lot of thoughts do you have any ideas on how you can filter the noise out and focus on them great ideas that you have inside yeah I think um, it almost sounds like a very counterintuitive thing, but when you're planning, think of your big picture, like the biggest picture. Don't think revenue for 2021 looks like this in this many clients. Think about the mission of your business. And once you're clear on the mission, the values, and inherently that will come with some boundaries and some non-negotiables, um, filter all your ideas through that. Does this idea get me closer to my mission or my overall desired impact? If you want to be number one in your field, if you want to, um, you know, I'm a service based business. I want to work with a thousand people in a way that's still deepening a year later. So automatically, that means I value long term over short term. Doesn't mean that I don't do short term. But those ideas are noisier. Yeah, because I've got that lens of is it getting me closer to this? Because the reality is you're going to get there. You're never going to really know the time. It's like when anyone sets a big strategy to take over, you could say, oh, if we keep going on this trajectory, we'll be number one in the industry by the end of 2025. Yeah, you, know, you could you know, look at the government, look at our, our sort of UN goals and things like that. We set a stake in the ground, but we know that everything happens on the way. It's incremental choices. So. I, I'm also a creative person. I get an A3 piece of paper or a whiteboard. I recommend a whiteboard. <laughs> Empty your brain of all the ideas and then put them through your lens. Definitely. I, I, I like working with colours, so yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, Fiona has said, thanks, Jazz. How far in advance and to what detail would you plan, i.e. plan out each quarter for the whole year or properly plan, oh, sorry, properly plan one Q in Q1 in first detail, let things evolve. And once you're into that, then start planning for Q2. So I think this one's quite a personal question because I think it depends on the type of business that you run. I think that having your plan for the year as a whole with flexibility. So by the end of the, by this time next year, this is what I want to be true. So whether that is a revenue um, amount, so whether that's metrics, whether that is looking at your clients or your customer base, what do you want that to look like? Are there segments you want to go into? And then plan Q1 in detail. In terms of my planning process, I do 90 day sprints essentially, and I check in on those goals um, and those milestones monthly and weekly, because then I don't, I feel less tempted to get overwhelmed. And by planning for an advance, you give yourself that moment of saying, right, if this is the market that I want to be working with by the end of the year, how can I start off? OK, Q1 maybe looks like building those relationships or researching that market. Q2 looks like then networking and presenting my solution. Q3 looks like actually getting somebody signing on the dotted line. And Q4 looks like then going back to the drawing board and just reiterating and, you know, doing focus groups, doing user research, understanding, um, you know, how have you found working with me so I can then iterate. So doing the long term as well as the short term can, I, I find it more of a realistic and human way of planning because then it means you kind of have your steps planned out in a kind of if this, then that. So then at those, if this, if this turns into this did not, you can you can adjust the step there knowing you're still on track definitely and um fiona's also asked which i was going to also add on to um what tools would you recommend that don't cost a lot for planning and strategy and my little side question was do you are you a list person so with your planning like do you have like a weekly list a daily list a priority list like do lists help you personally yeah so in terms of tools for planning and strategy, I just use my Google Docs. Um, I am a big fan of the Lean Canvas. Again, it depends on the type of business that you have. But um, the Lean Canvas, in a sense of getting the bones of your business on the paper, your cost, your revenue structure, the problem you solve, your unique, um, your unique solution, the bit that people can't re replicate, um, your markets. And then I review that on a monthly basis. So that also becomes an expression of the mission and everything like that. Um, and then, yeah, I just use Google Docs. So the Lean Canvas is just on a Google slide. 
So I have one page, I print it out, I stick it on my wall so I can see it in my day to day because it's very easy to plan and forget. And then I am a list person. But what I've learned over time is shorter. <laughs> Three to six things per day, absolute maximum. It's more towards three because I run my business around my day job. Um, so then you kind of get that dopamine hit of ticking things off. But also it means that you sit down at the top of the week and you go, what needs to be done? So before I used to say everything, what's everything that I need to get done? Now, when you're thinking about you as a finite resource, you then have to switch that question to go, what needs to be done this week? Because when you actually interrogate your projects, your client work even further, you start to realize, actually, this is, if, if I do chapter one of, of it this week, then I don't need to touch it for two weeks until I move on to the next thing. So you don't get overwhelmed feeling like you're going to smash absolutely everything. And you're, you're within your deadlines. But it's just realizing that you are a finite resource, especially in this current time. You, you never really know when you're going to need a break. And I say that to everyone. There are days I've opened the laptop and I'm doing the thing where I'm bouncing between the tabs and I've gone, oh, gosh, it's one of those days. Let me go for a walk and come back. I will probably need to do a bit extra tomorrow. But for today, I just can't get I just can't get out with me. Um, so especially in those moments, you can go back to your list and go, okay, what are the non-negotiables that I really need to get out of me? Um, so hopefully that answers the question. And then did I answer your side question? Yeah, the list one. And I think that was so yeah. helpful because I am a culprit of lists. I love a list, but I have a tend to like fill the whole sheet out and I'm like, this is everything I need to do. And then by the end of the day, I haven't done it. And I just keep moving it on day by day. And then it makes me feel awful because I'm like, oh, I'm obviously failing, but I'm not. I'm just obviously setting myself too much because you are always going to get more jobs that come in to do that day. So it's always going to be adding to your list. Anyways, I'm waffling on. Um, <laughs> oh, before we um, before we let you go, because you've been amazing, I just have one final question that I'm, I'm going to ask you. Um, one of our uh, listeners, Joe, has asked, because startups inherently tend to be more flexible and adaptable, do you think that they are more equipped rather than um, many other companies to deal with the uncertain times that we are currently living through? Having worked at several startups, I'm going to say it depends. It's less about the business stage. It's more about the processes and the communication structure, because that's what it comes down to. How fast can you raise a signal? How fast can you make a change? And I think um, I've worked in both corporate and startups. And the, the key differences that I found is that the communication is more frequent within the startup environment. So raising a flag becomes easier. And then over time, so I say this with a caveat that although startups live their lives on Slack, a lot of corporations are now on Teams. They're now using video calls and popping them in and being more flexible in terms of how we schedule and things like that. So I think it just goes down to regardless of the scale, the communication. If you're a company of 5,000 and you can get a message out just as effectively as the team of 10, then you are truly flexible and adaptable because you can bring the people in the room to make the decision and then take action on it. Definitely. Great answer. Well, thank you so much, Daz. Thank you for answering all of our questions and thank you for your wonderful session. It was such a pleasure having you on. Thank you. Um, well, now I would like to welcome, sorry, getting all flustered, get my questions up. Um, now I would like to welcome the lovely Chris and Alex um, to our screens. So joining us, I won't do full intros because obviously they will do much better ones than I can do them justice. But we have Dr. Alex Young, um, founder and CEO of Verti, and Chris Knight, the CEO and founder of CKX. Thank you both so much for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with me today. How are you both to start with? Great to be, yeah, really well, thank you. And hey, everyone um, watching on the webinar. <laughs> yeah, great, thanks. Uh, great keynote as well. Great to be here. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, as I say again, it's great to have you both here. And um, first of all, I would like to kind of, sorry, I'm just wondering where my questions have gone to. Um, first of all, I would just like for you both to kind of give yourselves a little intro better than I can do you um, and tell us a little bit about Verti and CKX, what you guys do and kind of how you came to founding these startups. Um, Alex, I'll pass the baton to you first. 
Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I've, I've got a bit of a weird background. So um, as mentioned, I used to be a, a doctor, but I've had a couple of companies uh, in the past. So one I kind of sold when I was a med student, um, another I kind of scaled up around my uh, time as a sort of NHS trauma orthopedic surgeon, um, both in the kind of education space. So, so my I guess, you know, JAM is all about education and improving the workforce with technology, really. And, and then I left my clinical practice around about two and a half years ago now uh, to found Verti, um, really with a mission to make experiential uh, education, i.e. kind of on the job training across any sector for anyone affordable and accessible uh, to improve human performance. Um, and we kind of do that using a variety of technologies, uh, including uh, machine learning, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, through a, a corporate training dashboard. And um, we are based uh, usually out of, out of Bristol, um, but we also have a, a team uh, based in the United States and we scaled up very, very quickly over the last two years. Um, so grew by kind of a thousand percent over the last, you know, just 12 months. Um, so we've seen some, some pretty crazy growth, um, which again, very happy to kind of chat about. Definitely, and I'm keen to hear more about that. Um, Chris, please tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey, and CKX. Sure. So my, my journey, I suppose, started uh, getting involved in computers around eight or nine years old from a very early age, and then doing stuff teenagers in tech space probably shouldn't be doing, but probably do do. Uh, then I studied uh, uh, what well, was a very unknown and niche subject at the time at university in 2000 uh, for artificial intelligence and robotics. I then finished that degree. I worked mainly in my early years in space and defense sector, more on the space side. So I designed satellite systems such as Galileo and Skynet. Um, my CV looked like Terminator for a little while because I specialize in neural networks and I worked on Skynet. So uh, that question came up a few times uh, in interviews. Uh, then I worked on medical software. I worked on high frequency trading, um, basically all high risk software systems. Then uh, about three, four years ago, I created CKX for sort of an out sourced innovation hub for uh, companies we also build help startups get off the ground so we help we're, if we're if we're talking to corporates we're an outsourced innovation company if we're talking to startups we're more of your outsourced uh, tech team and if you're a government we're sort of more of a consultancy and help them with quantum and ai things um I was supposed to be in the White House now, but with COVID, uh, <laughs> I got pushed back in other events as well, I suppose. Uh, we don't have to go into. Um, yeah, and we're about to launch our first person, our first own product, which is Agrobot, which uses satellite data and AI to diagnose crop stresses and disease with the plan to drastically reduce farmers' reliance on pesticides whilst increasing their revenue for doing so. Oh, wow. We're more on that, I think, in the next year. But we're, okay. sl we're we've sl we've finally unveiled it, the secret project this week. So hence the logo. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, I'm loving your background. And the uh, the White House is so overrated anyway, so you'd rather much be here on a <laughs> webinar with us today. <laughs> right. Much more, much happier to be in sunny Clapham right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, keen to hear more about both your stories um my first question to you is probably quite a an, an easy one to ease us in but how has the year 2020 been for your businesses and what kind of changes um have you seen kind of in the industry and what challenges may have have you faced along the way um alex i'll pass this one to you first yeah i mean it's, it's a really interesting question and i think um you know, I'm sure everyone will say it's been sort of mixed. So um, I think, you know, we've seen kind of a global pandemic hit every single person in every single sector. Um, and obviously it's something that's affected people's health. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of repercussions on the sort of, you know, personal side can, can be quite stark. I mean, for, for us in um, the training sector, we, we've been relatively fortunate in that everything we were sort of talking about, I suppose, last year before the pandemic hit were, were things like, how do you scale face-to-face -face training? You know, why, why do you need to be in work to learn? Um, and, and then a lot of what the pandemic has done has then forced, uh, you know, potentially quite slow moving corporate organizations that we work with to, to sort of accelerate their adoption of some of 
our technologies and, and sort of similar technologies. Um, so on, on the kind of business side, um, I think we've been, we found it quite humbling that we can kind of help people, especially in the healthcare sector, um, to, to, to really kind of meet the challenge of, of this kind of COVID surge response in, in hospitals. So um, partly because of my background, we do quite a lot of work with um, healthcare providers, both in, in the US, uh, in the NHS and kind of globally as well. Um, and I was actually out in um, Los Angeles at Cedar sinai Hospital uh, back in kind of February, March, when things started kicking off uh, in California. And it was really interesting seeing how um, you know, our technology could be used to sort of uh, scale uh, upskilling of, of frontline healthcare workers really, really quickly. So, um, you know, things that we sometimes take for granted that, that health professionals might know, like how to actually put on protective equipment uh, is, is actually quite challenging. So we were able to help, you know, scale up, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of kind of health professionals to do that. Um, people were coming back from retirement to help out people who've been graduated from medical and nursing school. So we're able to play a you know small role in in, in helping with that side of things and, and reducing uh, employees kind of anxiety around um, helping patients. And then I think from um you know this kind of flip side to to our product, um, we were already set up to be quite kind of remote anyway. So our main tech team is based in Bristol, which is a, a great tech hub outside of, of London, and I'd argue, you know, one of the better tech hubs kind of internationally as well. Um, and, and so we've had to sort of, you know, adapt and, and adopt some, some uh, extra help for people, like sort of, you know, paying for uh, desk modifications at home and, and looking after people's kind of mental health and focus while they're um, stuck with their, you know, young children and having to be teachers <laughs> and, and, you know, carers in some cases, as well as being employees. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been a really, really interesting time. We've learned a lot. And um, uh, we were just saying kind of, you know, before the panel, we, we've been, again pretty kind of humble just over the last week or so so we picked up a couple of awards um one last week was um the, the time best hundred inventions of, of 2020 for our technology which is really cool um and actually for our help with uh, the covid response in the us we got featured on the nasdaq time in times square um back in kind of the summer albeit with everyone stuck at home so there's no one in person to see it but we've got a very nice picture of it which is is what matters Definitely. And it, it's, it's good to see, you know, businesses doing well. And like, obviously, you've, you've been succeeding, but it's also helping others. So it's, yeah, it's a really good story to, to see. And you said, obviously, um, in your intro that you guys scaled 1000%. Was that even before this year and all the increase that you've seen this year as well? Yeah, exactly. So I mean, that that's kind of from, uh, you know, sort of middle of last year, really. So we, we, I mean, technically, we only really started kind of scaling up and, and truly commercializing the product from probably around about kind of April time last year, really. Um, and and so, you know, we've seen a kind of huge amount of demand and, and that's, you know, meant a couple of things. So firstly, we've had to actually meet that demand in terms of kind of customer support, customer success, a little bit, you know, like, like kind of Jazz's background that, that she was talking about. So making sure the customers were supported and happy and we were able to meet that demand. Um, and then also bringing on, you know, more people on the kind of product side um, around how the technology is 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 utilised. And um, I think, you know, I'm sure Chris will touch on um, some of the, you know, the deeper aspects of kind of machine learning and things like that, but actually having, you know, building an in-house um, basically data science team to help us handle then, you know, the increasing amounts of training data that were coming through. Um, and, and we sort of utilise artificial intelligence in a number of ways from kind of computer vision analysis of, of recorded training video um, to using natural language processing for analyzing team-based communication skills in healthcare and a couple of other things. But um, obviously, as you get more people coming through and using the platform, you get more data sets, you get more kind of, uh, you know, force on your, your cloud servers, and then you need uh, more uh, data scientists to make sure that you're analyzing that data correctly. So yeah, been really, really interesting kind of meeting that demand. Definitely, definitely. And Chris, you know, how has 2020 been for CKX? It, it all sounds exciting, you know, with, your new, um, with the new Agrobot. Um, and also, I'm going to add another question to, to yours. Um, has COVID kind of affected um, the technology sector that you guys are in? Have you seen any trends um, that COVID has impacted it? Yeah, I mean, from our, our, our own selfish perspective, we, we had 100% growth for every year we've been in existence. And uh, we were planning to do the same again this year. Uh, I think, like everyone, we, in March, we had a bit of a panic attack. 
like everyone. Uh, and it was also sort of uh, set ourselves up for a harder year than it was probably going to be. So we're still on track to do that this year, which is a great sign. Uh, I think the um, but where we're getting that growth is actually from our existing client base. Our sales pipeline was just crushed in March, um, which is disappointing for us because our, our sales cycles are really long, uh, relatively speaking. So to lose your sales pipeline, it's a big hit. But thankfully, we were managed to double down on, a, on the people we already had and trusted. We had to get creative with them because they were obviously had a bit of a panic attack as well as March. Uh, so we got creative with the pricing structures and whatnot. But uh, I think you know, that we've started to play a more longer term with those clients rather than just a short bill at the end of the month, um, which I think in the long term will be beneficial for us. Yeah. Um, and, but it's also the short term benefit as well as we have a much closer time with the, our clients now as well as a result because they realized that we were we were more than just in it for the invoice at the end of the month. Like when they were, uh, well, when they perceived that they were going to be struggling, it didn't turn out that they weren't going, and they had a great year as well. A lot of our clients, uh, but at the time we didn't know that. But we, uh, you know, we really shone through and showed them that we were there no matter what. But so from a client perspective, I think there was lots of opportunity this year to build stronger ties with the ones you have, uh, because we lost our sales pipeline. We could just focus on the clients we currently have, and we just sort of gave up in March is like yeah it's no point in doing external sales right now it's just not gonna well who's interested in uh well we're often viewed as a luxury spend I suppose but we can go into why that's a mistake but anyway that's same it's often perceived mm -hmm. um and double down on that I think from we, we also got our fingers in lots of pies because we were our clients are always going through funding rounds. We have corporate clients, we have government clients. And I think from a funding perspective and a corporate client perspective and becoming a client of a corporate, the money was always there and the tent was always there. But what we realized was that the bar was raised, uh, particularly for like, if you're selling to a corporate, our clients and ourselves were experiencing some directorships had concessionary budgets of about six figures so you could just squeeze in under it without getting board approval but all of a sudden board approval for everything you know over 10 grand and that just lengthened everything out and similar effect but for a different reason for investment investors didn't run away but they sort of went yeah well instead of three big clients we now want you to have five um but the money was still there and it's still available you just have to go for more hoops i think from a technical perspective and our own um lens there's, there's, from a team management perspective nothing really changed and in, in a weird way the covid brought the world towards the tech lifestyle uh and that we're now socially acceptable to stay inside every day and not go out anywhere and spend your weekends doing working on your projects which is something devs always do because they tend to love their job and they well, we don't have to go into the stereotypes of the software developers but um I mean, we even I, we were invited to do a podcast to how to do long term working from home because developers are just so well attuned to it. It's what we've always done. Yeah. So we sort of took that in our stride uh, in a sense that the world's coming to us in that way. <laughs> uh, and you know, having talks around it, working from home is more about just putting your laptop on your living room and thinking uh, from a morale perspective, everything's going to be fine. That's not working from home. That's working from your. Uh, countertop that's not a long-term plan um but what I also meant from our sales pipeline uh drying up uh that also brought forward plans for our own internal products because all of a sudden we had lots of spare hands um and we made the decision to double down on our, our own products and push that release dates forward a lot more and focus a lot more of our spare capacity on that so it drastically changed the business model from the company uh, in, in the sense that we're all traditionally a core service company, uh, but we're trying to diversify into having our own product range. So hence the agrobot part. And it changed our strategy in the sense that we started to bring that a lot quicker and a lot for, much more forward than we had planned, anticipated. Um, so it's had the big effect of that. Uh, in terms of the AI field, it's not really changed. Maybe it's not. Maybe not great to hear, but or interesting to hear. But I don't think the AI sector has changed a lot. I'm one of these people that argues there's not been new science in AI since 1980. So we've had incremental steps. We've had external factors that have made AI the leaps and bounds it's had over five years. But they're 
external rather than to the AI field. And nothing's changed since the 80s, so nothing really has changed over the past year. Maybe people have become more interested in it. It's found more, I mean, when I started it in 2000, it was very much viewed as a solution looking for a problem. And I suppose in the last three, four years, it started to find a home and it's starting to find an actual purpose and it's viewed now as a solution to many problems. Maybe viewed as a solution to too many problems that it just can't solve, but uh, I'd rather have that problem than the hard sell I was doing in the early noughties. Definitely, definitely. It's, it's a really interesting point. And, and Alex, do you, would you agree with that? What's your view? Has, do you think that um, COVID has impacted uh, artificial intelligence and, and the industry? Has it had any effects on AI? I mean, I, th I think, um, and, and again, I get, you know, we're talking about kind of like AI in, in sort of like quite broad terms. There's like multiple different use cases. I mean, I, I kind of always think of things in, in terms of like the, the useful applications, really. And um, I mean, I think increasingly, especially in kind of the healthcare sector, we're seeing it more it be becoming like just a natural part of some organizations, you know, technology transformation plans in the same way that kind of big data and cloud computing um, you know, has has sort of um, revolutionised how people handle some of their data that comes through their their servers. Really, so um, I, I think um, it's been interesting. I, I think actually COVID has probably um, you know pushed forward more simple solutions uh, in actually in the near term because I think what you've got to remember is a lot of sectors, not just healthcare, but you know things like banking and, and other just huge slow moving sectors have been slow to adopt any type of technology. Um, so if you look at the NHS, for example, very few people are using, you know, any kind of like remote VOIP or, or telehealth solutions at all. Um, and, and suddenly, you know, people weren't able to see their patients in person. And then that was forced upon uh, GPs, it was forced on surgeons, it was forced on tons of people. So actually, if you look at like uh, NHSX and that innovation department, the key things they focused on were remote monitoring for patients and how they could accelerate the adoption of that and telehealth. Now... I guess on the sort of, you know, on both of those two things, um, th there are elements of kind of like natural language processing applied to some triage solutions um, that, that kind of take over the, uh, the functions like the NHS um, 111 sort of triage service where you're, you know, sure you've seen them where you sort of talk to bots like, like Ada or, or what sort of Babylon Health are building. But again, a lot of those have come up against some struggles because of accuracy and things like that, as you've probably seen in the press. Um, yeah. I, I think the flip side is then also on how um, these things could then be applied to kind of remote um, help of, of patients. So whether it's uh, computer vision analysis of, sort of scans and things like that, or, or, you know, our type of technology were, um, were much more on the kind of, um, you know, training and kind of practical implementation around how you can actually turn previously subjective things like communication skills or leadership into comparable kind of predictive data that, that you can help accelerate training and save costs for healthcare organizations or other sectors. Um, so I, I think, I think it, the, the answer is again, what one is on the fence is it's kind of depends on, on where it's being deployed and what it's being used. I, I would say overall, um, if you asked most companies in, in the, um, you know, in the space who utilize some form of machine learning, their products likely have, have seen more uptake, um, especially when they're look at, looking to kind of reduce in-person requirement and um, do it. But I mean, I, I kind of, my, my feelings are a little bit similar to what Chris said before. I, I don't think, you know, the technology is not massively changed. I think what, what is changing is, is people's kind of perception of it. And I think also actually the kind of providers like, like us um, around making sure that you communicate you're actually solving a problem that, that it's not sort of you know a nice to have thing um, and that you make sure it is actually solving a real problem for the customers that, that you're interfacing with yeah. i mean i think i think i think ai in the medical field in the last year or so has actually been exciting um I, i'll speak in more general terms i suppose about yeah but if you look at the medical sector it has been really exciting in the last couple of years and the medical sector is an interest. I often use it as an example one of the earliest ai systems in, the, in existence was a stanford a system called mycin it was developed in the 1960s for blood diseases but the reason why it's an interesting test case it was an early indication that humans just didn't want to trust a system no matter what stats you threw at them they were not interested in being diagnosed from a doctor fast forward to now um, and i think whilst it's just a marketing term uh, in the medical field specifically i prefer the term augmented, augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence uh, and I think the pushbacks from the early mice in years, 
and everything since, including autonomous cars, is the feeling that the, the AI is making a decision. Where the reality is where AI is right now across the board, but I think medical fields particularly clinging on to this idea now is that it's a great second opinion. It's a great input to a decision, but it's not the decision maker. And I think the interesting case that I heard, I mean, the, the, this example has been around for a few years, but it came up again recently, was that AI is actually incredibly good at spotting breast cancer. Uh, to the point it's actually more accurate, depends on you, how, you phrase, how you take that phrase, but in some ways it's more accurate than consultants. But where that's really good is when the, a consultant looks at a scan and says, I don't think there's any cancer here, but then the AI says, I think there is. What that then kicks off is a deeper investigation. Um, so no one's lives are in AI's hands, but it's giving it's helping make decision. It's adding more data to the consultant for them to make their decision and to have perhaps signal a more deeper understanding. And you touched on natural language process. I, I, I know some people, some of my friends are actually working on, and this was pre-COVID, so they were definitely excited, but uh, they were building an AI system using NLP to uh, find novel uses for existing medicines. So they were building NLP models to troll through all the medical journals and all the documentation on medicines and trying to get the AI to flag medicines that may have uses beyond their initial intent. Uh, and then, of course, COVID came along. And then, of course, that was the big buzz. Is there something we can already use? And, you know, Trump has had his opinion on malaria tablets, but there are other candidates uh, that could have done something. But that, again, that's where AI is better suited. It's not a decision maker at any stretch of the imagination right now, but it's great to have as a second opinion or an extra parameter for the decision maker. Uh, yeah, definitely. And that may you speaking there, Kristen, like you said, um, it being a second opinion rather than you putting it all in like AI's hands. Um, is are people warming to you know artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and machine learning, all these deep technologies? Um, because they it did used to get quite a bit of bad press. Or do you still see a lot of negativity negativity around it? Are people coming around to the idea that it could? you know, go hand in hand with human interaction and work together to, to better the world um, sort of thing. I'll bat it over to, to either one of you, both of you. <laughs> well, I, th I think the trouble AI has always faced is that the term artificial intelligence is a great marketing phrase, but it's a very provocative phrase as well for humans. Like we, we hate the idea that something else is intelligent. That's supposed to be our USP. That's our USP. And now you're taking that away from us. So then we get really hot on the collar when we hear that and quite rightly so. Um, and then, of course, you look at popular culture. Like I, I mentioned 1980s, and there's a lot happening around 1980s. If you imagine the popular culture and their Terminator, Space Odyssey, all these uh, AI films, because AI was bubbling, it almost broke through back in the 80s, but it didn't. We, that's a different podcast and why that isn't. But that's, that's the truth. But that's where we get a lot of our cues from. Um, I think that I'm not an Elon Musk fan. I, I'm all right with him. I, I don't, not that he cares, but you know, I, he's, 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 there's a lot of bust, bluster in there as well. Uh, but what, I think it was him that said that you know, his, his kids will probably never think twice about an uh, autonomous car. So I think AI is probably being accepted more, but I think that's a generational game than a uh, people changing their opinions game. Definitely. Uh, Alex, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I'd second that on, um, uh, you know, it being more of an augmentation and, and a help to humans that, than sort of fully replacing thing. And, and again, I, I think actually one of the things that has slowed down adoption in certain sectors like healthcare is, is people, um, you know, certain companies using the term AI as, as literally a promotional tool, um, which, which then rubs, you know, stakeholders up the wrong way, um, especially in the healthcare sector where people don't particularly like to be told what to do by, by anyone at the best of times. Um, and and I, I think, again, it's, it's about, you know, taking your customers on a journey so that they, they might not understand the technology in, in the same way that, you know, people on this webinar might, um, but you've really got to sort of link it to their problem help them to understand what integration means and how it might affect their kind of existing uh, you know, workflows. So that, that example that, that Chris gave, which is a great one of radiologists using uh, AI as, as a way to sort of triple check uh, when they're reviewing scans, uh, you know, that, that's a really good um, example. But, but again, the radiologists need to be convinced that it's not gonna take them you know, an extra 20 minutes per scan review to, to then look at the AI results and how's that gonna plug in and do the NHS, you know, 
uh, Dell computers, uh, are they able to utilize that software and all this kind of stuff, you know, but before we even start talking about people, people using it functionally. So I, I, I completely agree. And I, I think it's, um, it's something that, again, I, you know, for, for anyone who's running a company or any entrepreneurs or salespeople or customer success individuals, that, that is basically you know, your job. That's how you make your money. You've got to win people over. You've got to show them the technology works. You've got to prove it will work through case studies, through research, um, and, and, and then get it implemented to help the end user or, or you know, patients in, in terms of uh, you know, the NHS. I think there are three other more poignant reasons why it's held back as well. The first one is a little bit of a semi-technical point in that the, the traditional software are effectively decision trees. When you're writing traditional software, you're effectively writing if this, do that, if that, do this, then it's basically t tons of if and then statements everywhere. So you end up with a very decision tree system, which makes it very easy to test beyond any belief exactly how it's going to behave in specific circumstances. And the medical sector and specifically the defense sector love that. They, they hate straying anything. They want to know how it behaves in all circumstances for, for fair enough and obvious reasons. AI, can't, you can't do that with AI. In fact, it's a massive field of research in the field of AI is how to properly test it and how to properly to know how it's going to react in particular circumstances. We don't, there's no 100% way of knowing that. And that's why the medical sector for other reasons, but also this one is why it tends to shy away from it because you don't want to put someone's life under and go, well, normally it works well. <laughs> but I would argue that's what any surgeon, that, that you've got similar odds with a surgeon. Who knows, maybe the surgeon had a bad day that day. You know, AI is not too dissimilar for, again, not, it's not got emotions, but it has a similar end effect. Um, and I think the, the other, other hand of inhibitor is everyone always assumes it's ridiculously expensive to make. It sometimes is, sometimes it isn't. And uh, for me, that when you're building an AI system, 90% of the cost is typically in gathering data or cleaning data. Now, if you turned up with beautifully clean data, super organized, I will probably give you an AI model in a week, maybe two weeks, and I'd view that's quite luxurious. Uh, all the rest of the time, all the rest of the money as well, you don't have data. But there are ways around that. There are ways, like, just because you've got data doesn't mean that there's tons of open source data out there that you can use, an absolute plethora. And a more recent, uh, I, I said uh, incremental step, I should stick to that story. An increment, a very, a very big incremental step is something called knowledge transfer. And that's when you have a small data set. But what we can do is we can take an existing model uh, and it's almost doing what you want it to do, but needs a little bit of a nudge that way. We can use knowledge transfer to then use your smaller data set to then retrain the existing model to do exactly what you want it to do, with, which requires a much lower set of data. So I think the other inhibitor is this perception that it's r really expensive and long time running and it's not. And the, the other misconception as well is that it takes a long time. The training part takes a long time. To train it takes as long as you want to give it. But once you actually have the model, you can make these things make decisions in 100 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, that kind of order. It's yeah. just the tra it's just, it's the training part and it's the building the model that's the the resource heavy part. But once you've got the model in the hand, super cheap to run, no more expensive than traditional software. You don't, in fact, you can run it on a mobile phone some a lot of the time. So I think these preconceptions as well as what holds the AI field back as much as the perception. Definitely. Well, I could sit here and talk to you guys all day about it, but I am conscious of time. So I'm just going to ask you one last question um, before we before we say our goodbyes. And um, my, my question was going to be, you know, what changes do you think we may see as a result of this year? But I'm going to change it. Do you think that we will see any major changes um, next year or in the next few years not necessarily because of covid but if you do obviously uh, tell me why and what major changes um have you guys got planned if any that you can talk about uh, alex we'll start with you yeah sure so i mean i, th I think um I, I don't think it's you know by any means going to be an immediate return to normal i think you know from what we're seeing with with vaccines or with how people are sort of you know attempting to return at the moment so I suspect that there'll be continuous, um, you know, effect of this for quite some time. Obviously, you've seen scientists, you know, saying up to like four years or something like that. Um, so I think that there will be bits enforced by the continuing kind of coronavirus effect. I think beyond that, um, there are certain elements of things where people may well have actually seen immediate kind of cost savings benefits to their organisations. Um, that even if we were to go back sort of, you know, tomorrow to normal, 
they might want to you know continue to utilize so certainly things like sort of our training products um where, where they you know people have been using them for covid sort of specifics um we're now seeing them go go and use them across different areas of their their, their organization for other elements of training or, or collecting data on how people sort of perform and things like that um i mean for, for us personally um we've got a couple of new kind of products that we're going to be rolling out um in, in kind of Q1, Q2, um, we've got some really cool ways where we're sort of looking to help uh, actually sales teams and, and anyone who is, um, you know, prospecting to, to other companies. Because I think one thing um, that, that maybe has been a little bit forgotten is, especially in things like healthcare, large portions of like elective surgery completely shut down, which then had a secondary effect on things like medical device and pharma companies. Pharma now all, you know, focusing on um, coronavirus sort of um, uh, vaccine efforts so yeah i mean we're looking at sort of how our existing technology without a huge amount of, of tech changes can actually be applied to different use cases for existing customers which is, is super exciting amazing thank you and chris how about you and ckx what can we see and what do you think well, i've already touched upon our big future plan which is agribot i think for uh we've always worked remotely so i don't imagine that going to change at the end of this but i think the big interesting changes are as our company is going to get everyone back in the offices full time and you know the impacts that will have on you know lifestyles people live not and business as well everyone's sitting here at home companies used to always use the excuse well working from home is not going to work so we're not going to bother trying it well the cat's out the bag now so are they going to get get it back in full time probably not and you can look at the big corporates i mean i know some of the big four who have said that they're not even going back till june yeah. if that uh and you know all the changes that's going to bring in i'd like to think ai is going to fill a part of that particularly around filling the gaps when people have to physically be somewhere but maybe that's not the best option going forward uh for all sorts of reasons including maybe covid if it's still around in whatever form um so allowing ai to maybe step in and be the physical presence while we're sitting at home nice and warm in our hot coffee while the ai is out there catching fish in the atlantic or something like that i don't know um so i think it yeah maybe not maybe covid not change a bit the lasting effects of covid from a social perspective definitely i, I suspect of it yeah amazing well thank you both so much it was so insightful and i know we only just scratched the surface because you know ai and technology and everything that you guys do it's so complex so my hat's off to you because you guys both do amazing things so yes, thank you so much um, for joining us today. Um, before I leave you all for the last time of 2020, I just want to say another special mention to Mauser, the worldwide leading electronics distributor who you can read all about in our post event mailer. Um, we don't have time for questions, but if you want, you can um, contact us and we can put you in touch with these lovely people, all three of them. Um, and you can find out more and chat to them more. I could listen to you all, all day. And finally, female founders, if you haven't already, please check out our latest competition that is still running with Fiverr, where you can send us an elevator pitch on your business and be in with the chance of winning £5,000 to spend at Fiverr. You do not want to miss out and there isn't long left. Um, thank you all for joining us today and throughout the whole year. It's been such a fun year and a pleasure, especially, you know, considering the year we've all been through. So go away, have a nice break, have a nice Christmas if you can, stay safe. And we hope to see some of you in person next year, maybe, hopefully, fingers crossed, with all the amazing tech work. <laughs> Um, thank you always to my team. I couldn't do it without you. And again, a massive final thank you to Jazz, Alex and Chris. It's been a pleasure having you on today. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you next time. Bye for now.